crowding in or crowding out, accessing the role of distributed generation, solar photovoltaic in utility scale solar development, co-authored with Hongli Fong. Okay, so here's the roadmap of the presentation today. So I will start with introduction and then the conceptual framework, empirical model, data, and main results. So we know solar photovoltaic is an important renewable technology for the sake of environmental sustainability because it uses solar electric panels to directly convert solar radiation into electricity while creating zero carbon emissions and air pollutants. And basically there are two types of PV sensors, utility scale solar PV, USP, and distributed generation solar PV, DGSP. And utility scale solar PV sensors plays an important role um, in decarbonizing the power grid and leading the United States toward a um, low carbon future. And according to the estimates from National Renewable Energy Laboratory, the whole United States will be powered by utility scale solar, only um, occupied 0.6% of the country's land. And, and thus, a variety of policy incentives and incentives have been designed and implemented to promote the development of USB. And uh, in addition to promoting the development of USB, federal and state government, electric, electric utility companies and other market agencies have offered um, a handful of financial incentives to encourage household or commercial sectors to invest in DGSP. Both USP and DGSP have their own advantages and disadvantages. So for USP, um, it is more cost effective than DGSP, but it requires transmission facilities to grid um, for grid, grid connection and it may far away from the population center. And also it may require a giant massive land to install solar panels. And for DGSP, it saves costs in transmission and distribution and increase resilience during an outage allow more homeowners to participate. And, and the last one, it doesn't occupy land because uh, residents can just um, install solar panels on their rooftop. And, the, uh, and for the disadvantages, um, it is less cost effective than utility scale solar PV systems. So there is a long running debate about whether to build up the policies and incentives to also support DGSB in addition to promoting the development of USB. However, existing literature is inconclusive about which one, USB or DGSB, which one is better to have the society support. And maybe there is a room for both USB and DGSB to contribute to a low carbon economy for the United States, or maybe the adoption of DGSB could inhibit the investment of USB, which is more cost effective in um, reducing green, um, greenhouse gas emissions compared with DGSB. So existing literature have investigated the driving factors of um, USB adoption and DGSB adoption, but to our knowledge, less attention has been paid to the adoption of USB while incorporating the role of DGSB in their decision-making model. So the objective of this paper is to examine the role of DGSB in USB development. So specifically, does the development of DGSB crowd out the development of USB? And later on in the future step, we also seeking to um, understand what's the overall welfare impacts on greenhouse gas emissions caused by the development of DGSP. So here we highlight two contributions. So first of all, we provide a new perspective to the existing literature seeking to understand the drivers of USB adoption and how USB and DGSP interact um, in the context of the United States. 
and um, understanding how USB and DGSB interact is important for, especially for policy design for to fostering future solar development for the society overall. So to analyze how USB and DGSB interact, here we construct a two sector framework, including household, which is residential sector and utility companies, um, which is um, electricity supply sector in the framework. So let's um, first look at individual household decision-making model. So here's the basic setup. So suppose an individual household J reside within the service area of utility I, make one-time investment decision on DGSP complexity at time T equals to one. And individual household derive benefits from investing DGSP mainly through two channels. One is the net present value of return from the lifetime operation of the invested complexity. And the other one is the one grow of going solar, which is the, the mental satisfaction derived from the investment. And beta IJ is the complexity factor. So household can sell extra electricity generated from DGSP back to the grid at retail electricity price, PITR. So the underlying assumption is that utility set the net metering rate of one. And, and also for each unit of electricity generated from solar energy, household will award one solar renewable energy credit and they're allowed to sell the credits generated from DGSP at the price theta T at the local markets. So assume individual household will solve the, the utility maximization problem under the rooftop area constraints. And here, C as the turn representing one time investment cost of the GSP complexity. And SI is the financial incentives and subsidies that are available in utilities I's service area. So we can write down the Lagrangian and derive the first order conditions. And based on that, we can derive the following um, comparative statics regarding how retail electricity price affect individual households investment decision on DGSP complexity. And um, in individual utility companies interact through you know, deciding the price of retail electricity price based on their current com generating complexity on renewables, solar, and other sources. So this framework, we um, have one prediction. So as retail electricity price increases, new investment in DGSP capacity increases. And for a consumer who derive, derives larger non-economic benefits from solar or whose marginal cost of installing DGSP capacity is lower, then we observe a larger investment in DGSP. And we're gonna test that in the empirical section. Then let's move on to individual utilities decision. So for simplicity, um, we assume at T equals to zero, Utility I provides electricity service solely by non-renewable generation. And then at time T equals to one, they decide to build generating capacity on USB and non-renewable at different costs to satisfy electricity demand within a service area and also in state um, renewable power standard solar cap out, which mandates them to supply a minimum proportion of um, their electricity sold from alpha IT from zero to one from solar energy. And similarly, they will award one SREC for each unit of electricity generated from solar and the trading of electricity, um, real electricity and also SREC credits are allowed across the waste area of different utility at um, strictly positive price PTE and theta T respectively. And we assume individual utility will solve the cost minimization problem under the um, electricity demand constraint and uh, policy mandates. And similarly, we can derive the first order conditions. And basically it helps us utility companies will make investment, new investment decision on, on USP at the point where the marginal cost equals to the marginal revenue obtained from the lifetime operation. And 
Similarly, um, individual utilities decision model, we have one um, prediction. So if, if so the cutout is greater than zero, then DGSB capacity addition within utilities service jurisdiction will crowd out um, utilities new investment in um, capacity investment from USP. And again, we, we're gonna test that in Florida. And then let's move on to empirical model. And, and the goal of the empirical analysis is to identify the causal effect of investing in DGSP on the development of USP. So in the empirical analysis, the dependent variable is the contemporary new investment in USP or the um, capacity addition at the county level. And the key explanatory variable is the contemporary new investment in DGSP. And so the, here's our baseline model as shown in equation 17. So we use a face effects model. So UIT is the capacity additions of USB for county I in year T. And DIT is the capacity additions of DGSP for county I in year T. And we also include set of state and county level covariates that might also affect both DGSP and USB capacity additions. And county phase effects are used to control for the natural resource constraint. And year phase effects are used to control for annual shock that are um, common for all the counties in our study. And we also include regional specific linear tie trend to control for the like decreasing in installation costs of solar panels or the, um, the advance in technology at the regional level. So notice that our baseline model may have several potential issues related to identification. One is the interdependency between USP and DGSB capacity investments. And the second one is the measurement error issue regarding county level DGSB capacity because we obtain um, county level DGSB capacity data from um, Berkeley Laboratory. So they use the data from EIA and calculates the estimate based on county level population. So it could be the measurement error issue also induce um, endogeneity issues. So um, we're gonna, to address the concern, we're gonna use a simultaneous equation model with a two-stage method to address the endogeneity issue. So here's the two equations for both um, USP and DGSP, and XUIT and XDIT are set up exogenous variables for um, USP or DGSP. And then we can rewrite the equation as follow, which is more complex, and we can write the reduced form with the reduced form coefficient parameters and updated error terms. And to conduct the empirical analysis, we construct US county level panel data between 2012 and 2020, um, including county level USP capacity, county level DGSP capacity, and also we include policy incentives might also affect both USP and DGSP, and retail electricity price, and some county level demographic variables, including Democratic Party vote, which is used as a proxy for um, solar preference or renewable preference, and some solar uh, socioeconomic information that we might be interested in. So here's the, our main result. Um, the effects of DGSP capacity addition on USP investment, new investment. So column, columns one and two are, are the estimates using baseline model and column two, we add control variables and we do find a negative, significant negative impact, which um, indicates a crowd out, um, crowd out relationship between DGSP and USP capacity additions. And then remember we, we mentioned, so the first source of endogeneity issue comes from the interdependency between USP and DGSP. So here we first try to use the lag of DGSP capacity addition to control that part. Um, so yeah, consistently we find a significant negative impacts, but remember we still have the measurement error issue. So 
simultaneous equation model with two-stage method are used to address that concerns. The results are reported in um, column four and five. So the first stage results are shown in column four. So here highlight several coefficients. So for like retail electricity price and democratic party vote, that is used for the pharmaceutical solar power. So you see as retail electricity price and solar power is higher, then the um, capacity addition of DGSP goes higher. So this is consistent with our proposition one in the empirical section. And then in the second stage, we found a significant negative impact here with the magnitude of negative 1.67, which means that as the DGSP capacity addition increased by one unit, then the um, that will crowd out utility scale USP capacity additions by 1.67. Um, and yeah, that is also consistent with our um, proposition two. And then because um, the electricity markets in the United States are mostly regional based. So within the region, the, like the technology applied market structure and installation costs are pretty similar within the region, but it could be very different across region. So here we, we're we trying to do the analysis based on region and see if there's hazardous impacts across region. So here from estimate, we, we see most of the, the region exhibits a negative impact patterns, but mostly are not statistically significant. And RFC, which is reliability first, Cooperation shown in the, the green area here. Um, this is the only region exhibits a significant crowd out impact pattern. Yeah, so those are the, the main results and the presentation today. Yeah. So, That's good. any questions? Um, thank you. I think this is great. Um, I just have a question about the crowding out effect that you're trying to find out. Um, so the crowding out effect is mainly for like within that specific county, or have you ever considered about like the crowding out effects on potential like neighborhood um, county, or is that something that's not like okay? Very, um, very because I, I, I feel like your data is only like county level, like mm -hmm. yearly. It's not like super granulated, but like if that's something. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. So, so right now we are thinking about the crowd out within the county. So within the county, whether the, you know, the development of DGSB will crowd out USB within the county. But yeah, it's also very interesting to study yeah, like for the neighboring county, what's the, the impact patterns? Yeah. I think, like, um, there um, should be somewhat type of filters for like spillover. Um, like, spillover, yeah. Across, yeah, spillover across um, counties because, like, if this county adopts an USB and the neighborhood county has figured out, oh, they adopted maybe it's better for, for us too. And they, it's like this information sharing and the information spillover. That might be clear here. Mm -hmm. You might even like consider a game if that's possible. Like, I don't know if this crowd out is like mm -hmm. too far um, from what you were thinking. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's more like spillover effects. Yeah, I, I, I didn't consider that in our setting, but I think it's very worth exploring and see how we can do that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So yeah, we're using per, per capita personal income and pu um, population density and also some incentive design for 
on DGSB as a as as IVs in the first stage. So it's like what exactly is you know like we want it to be only directly affecting DGSB but not USB. Mm -hmm. Could you like elaborate a little bit on that? Like what are the specific characteristics that only affect? Oh, I guess only directly affect DGSB but not. USB. Okay, like for these variables, those cost incentives are designed only for DGSB. Oh. Yeah. That makes sense. And yeah, I just really like it. Oh. Sorry about it. So, you have been talking about the town, but I don't know how much you respond to the table because the utility is serving, like, mm -hmm. they're basically doing everything for whatever reason is always going on with their serving. And uh, perhaps you want to pay mm -hmm. attention to those. Mm -hmm. Now, I know the, solar, the, the distributed solar adoption data uh, is that six level? I think it's at six level. Oh, I think you probably mentioned is it open PV data which is recorded at the project level from Berkeley yeah, Lab? Yeah, yeah, true. There is our, yeah, I think there's our next step. So currently we're using the data from Berkeley Lab from 2012 to 2020. And we do recognize the limitation in the data because some of like the policy incentives we don't have much variation. So we are trying to complement our data using the tracking itself. Yeah. So do you think maybe you have to somehow find the map and then go like Yeah, true. Yeah, true. This, um, yeah, geographic unit is also one of the one of our concerns because um, now we are looking at county. So the underlying assumption is that the the factor, the driving factors affecting um, utilities utilities decision also the fact county, but it may not be true. Yeah. So yeah, that is our. Mm -hmm. That's going to produce maybe one unit of in messages, right? Yeah. So that means the capacity. But it's going to happen with the next one. And we wouldn't have to do that. Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah, very good. Really, like, figure it, uh, figure it out, like, which specific grid is actually serving that mm -hmm. specific area. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be just the global event checks. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a different model. It's just like different, um, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is just our, you know, <coughs> initial result is just trying that. Yeah, but. Yeah, geographic unit is one of our very big concern. Yeah, and the direction for NASDAQ. And also we, yeah, um, because there is not a complete paper. So, and in the NASDAQ, we, we're also looking at the kind of the welfare impacts or is there any social inefficiency induced by the development of TGSB as well. Mm -hmm. be, uh, to a more broad renewable energy. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, you're assuming that if you go one to the solar, the only effect that you're going to see is on the solar, and then out, but maybe you think about the whole effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because the main idea of the solar or, or the quarters is saying, Okay, Yeah, I do consider about that. So basically, basically the logic will be very similar. Yeah, but we focus on solar because the debate on whether you know these DGSB or USB 
um, which one should be support or will can they coexist? You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, they have to coexist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I think the, okay. when you just say project, we are looking at like one dollar invested in how much car and it's less due to ESP or BPSP. Then it's, it's the same thing. There's mm. the same amount of one dollar invested. Yeah. Three dollars on the entire post, the cost is $50,000. Even the normal car and it's less because of the same amount. Yeah. There, like doing like a individual choice model because you know the other options could potentially just be, I guess, an outside option. <laughs> so you, know, you don't have to look them all, but they are going to it and they're going to figure out the, the actual value. But I, I don't know, I, I have not very much, um, I guess, an educational model mm -hmm. that. So I, I don't know if it's like that's just. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I can think about this and maybe we can talk more about this later. Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you. Good morning again. So uh, in this paper, I'm going to present mostly our analytical findings on designing efficient payments to incentivize greenhouse gas mitigation using energy crop production. So relatively en uh, perennial energy crops with an effective lifespan of 10 to 15 years are unique in many ways compared to forests as well as conventional row crops. First, they store atmospheric carbon in soil, right? And then they also uh, the derived cellulosic biofuels can, can uh, reduce the emissions in the atmosphere by uh, displacing fossil fuels, which are very ca carbon in intensive as well. Uh, the thing about uh, agricultural soil carbon sequestration, such as conservation tillage, uh, is that they can coexist with uh, row crops, but uh, for energy crops, they they need land use conversion, which incurs substantial opportunity cost, the foregone profits from existing land use or row crops in particular. And the other, uh, the other difference is like uh, annual harvesting of biomass from these uh, energy crops allows us to uh, earn revenues uh, from the market at a price which depends upon uh, energy content compared to gasoline or something like that. Uh, so basically <clears throat> there is a, Pro production constraint in energy crops. There is uh, like profit profitability concerns and not much of energy crop has been produced because of high establishment cost, as well as uh, there is not definite biomass price for these uh, feed stocks currently. So to induce their production, uh, we need to compensate for their ecosystem services, both below ground soil carbon sequestration, as well as above ground emissions abatement. And of course, uh, uh, to design the soil carbon sequestration payment, we need to capture the spatial and temporal aspects of soil carbon sequestration. Since uh, we have like uh, improved modeling techniques to measure the soil carbon sequestration these days. So mitigation payment <clears throat> for displacing fossil fuels is like, could be said equal to a marginal benefit of one unit of carbon, not in the atmosphere permanently. So it could be said, said equal to social cost of carbon or carbon price, whatever you may call it. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, difficulties or complexity, 
complexities in designing soil carbon sequestration payments. And the first one is like uh, the temporary nature of soil carbon sequestration. You never know how, how long this uh, particular unit of carbon in the soil remains. It's released back into the atmosphere at some point of time, right? Uh, and the farmers have incentive to switch back to row crops uh, given there are changing row crop prices and changing uh, carbon prices as well as declining soil carbon sequestration amounts over time. So basically a sequestration payment should essentially capture the time period uh, a unit of carbon is stored in the soil. So there should be a time variant sequestration payment. Another important aspect or uh, complexity in designing efficient payments, uh, carbon payments is the issue of additionality. Uh, it just says like, um, uh, it has to be paid for the landowners who would not have provided these uh, services or like uh, benefits in absence of such payments. So we had this um, multiple questions related to design, efficient design of carbon payments for incentivizing energy crop production. So first one is like, uh, we try to address the temporary nature of soil carbon sequestration in designing uh, soil carbon sequestration payment, which we call as impermanence. And we look at the conditions where permanently storing soil carbon is optimal when there are changes in row and uh, energy crop prices, as well as carbon prices, given there are declining soil carbon sequestration rates over time. And we look at the factors determining allocation of a land between row and energy crops under the prescience of both sequestration and mitigation payments. And we also try to address if uh, uh, the efficient carbon payments uh, should vary temporarily as well as especially. And at the end, we also uh, try to decide if the choice of the benchmark in addressing the issue of additionality will impact the cost efficiency of the payment scheme and the amount of optimal carbon abatements or sequestration. So we start with a social planner choosing optimal allocation of land between row and energy crops. And it includes uh, the payups, which include row crop profits, uh, energy crop profits, carbon mitigation benefits, and then the soil, uh, soil carbon stock benefits uh, given a social cost of carbon or carbon price. Uh, here in the equation two is the equation of motion. So which, um, the change in total soil carbon stock or simply put the total net flow of soil carbon in each year, uh, which includes sequestration or desequestration of continued added or removed energy crop uh, acreage in each rotation of the energy crop. So we assume a negative exponential time path to capture soil carbon sequestration, where the total, uh, sorry, the, the unit flow of soil carbon depends upon soil carbon sequestration parameters. The first one is a long run equilibrium level of soil carbon under energy crop. We can define them as like saturation point. <clears throat> and the another one is natural growth rate of soil carbon accumulation. Uh, simply put, it's a rate of sequestration. So these are some of the analytical results. So basically we know that from economic theory, the social planner would allocate land to energy crop till the NPV of, NPV of uh, biomass revenues uh, plus uh, soil carbon mitigation benefits and soil carbon stock benefits exceeds the NFE, NPV of grain revenues from row crops. That's the simple economic uh, equality. So basically um, we assume a total cost function, which is uh, convex. Uh, basically um, the land is heterogeneous in quality. That's what we are assuming. So that we need more and more agriculture inputs to realize same level of yield across different units of land because of the diminishing quality of the land. Uh, so first analytical result is like the land is initially converted to energy crop, uh, but then there are subsequent removal of energy crop across rotation after rotation, mainly because of declining soil carbon flows across time. The first, uh, but the, uh, but if there is increase in the saturation point or the, let's say rate of sequestration, then energy crop acreage increases but that depends upon the social cost of carbon or the rate at which the social cost of, cost of carbon is changing or increasing over time. And of course, the imposition of different payment durations, the terminal time or the contract ends when the time uh, dip, uh, will define uh, the magnitude of energy crop change in each rotation because it also changes the 
sequestration payments because sequestration sequestration payments are time variant. So if we if we store the soil carbon for a longer duration, we need to pay higher. If we store it just for one year, it could be just rental value of the soil carbon stock, very small amount. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so basically the dollar per ton sequestration payment for carbon should be the shadow value of the soil carbon stock, which means uh, the impact of storing one unit of carbon in the soil from say a small T to capital T, initial to terminal time, uh, and it also depends upon discount rate as well as social cost of carbon. Uh, whereas the sequestration payment, if we look at it as a per, per hectare sequestration payment, it varies over time because the soil carbon flow is changing over time. The ton of carbon per hectare uh, accumulation is changing over time, which depends upon saturation rate and rate of sequestration. Uh, mitigation payment is straightforward. It's just the uh, social cost of carbon, but it the dollar per hectare mitigation payment also changes over time, only if social cost of carbon is changing. Because we are assuming the expected energy crop is a constant number in our uh, model. Basically, we are taking average, average yield for energy crop. It changes across 15 years of the energy crop, right? But we are just assuming an average annual crop yield. <laughs> so the dollar per hectare sequestration payment also varies due to especially varying soil carbon flows, which again depends upon special characteristics of the soil carbon process, is sequestration process, the saturation point, as well as the rate of sequestration. And the mitigation payment in dollar per hectare also varies across space, across individual landowners, because the energy crop expected yields also changes across individual landowners. So uh, to summarize the efficient dollar per hectare payments, which is a sequestration plus mitigation payment, uh, is temporarily heterogeneous, either because of the dynamic carbon price or the functional form that captures the soil carbon sequestration process, a declining soil, soil carbon flows over time. Uh, similarly, the efficient dollar per hectare carbon payments are especially heterogeneous as well because of the heterogeneity in the soil carbon sequestration process. Uh, and also uh, we look at the expected energy crop yields being especially heterogeneous across landowners. Okay, so we look at the carbon payments here, dollar per ton and dollar per hectare and how they are especially heterogeneous. In the first figure, in the top row, we, we can see that soil carbon flow is especially heterogeneous as it changes, uh, as it is changing across individual landowners with different rate of sequestration and different rate of saturation point. And in the second and third figure on the top row, we can we can see the dollar per ton and dollar per hectare sequestration payments uh, for a given static as well as dynamic carbon price. So the mu is a uh, rate of growth of carbon price. Mu 0 0.01 is like the carbon price is growing exponentially at 1%. In the bottom row, uh, you can see that on the first figure, we have carbon emission abatements, ton of carbon abated per hectare, which also depends upon expected energy crop yields. And then on the second and third figure, we can see that dollar ton, dollar per ton and dollar per hectare mitigation payments corresponding to the carbon abatements in figure one for a static as well as dynamic carbon price. So permanence means uh, we're trying to permanently sequester carbon. So we look at if permanence is optimal or not optimal. So if permanent has to be optimal, uh, the total payoff from energy crop from each acreage in succeeding rotation has to be at least equal to was what it was in the previous uh, preceding rotation. So we can pay soil carbon sequestration equal uh, payment equal to mitigation payment, but that doesn't guarantee that the soil carbon remains in the soil forever because there are changing row crop prices, right? And changing uh, soil carbon as well as um, soil carbon, sorry, carbon prices as well as declining soil carbon flows over time. So basically if all the price parameters are constant across time. Uh, permanence is never optimal because we know that uh, based on our uh, functional form, the soil carbon flows are declining over time. So that means uh, we are not going to take that one hectare of land in energy crop permanently. Uh, second case is like when, only, when the crop prices are constant, then a positive uh, uh, change in, a positive increase in, um, 
social cost of carbon is a necessary condition for the optimality of the permanence uh, and is a necessary condition but is not a sufficient condition so if the social cost of carbon uh, the growth rate of social cost of carbon is at least equal to the rate of sequestration then permanence is optimal uh, in the third case if uh, only energy crop price is constant then permanence is rarely optimal uh, the case even even when there is equality of rate of sequestration as well as the uh, rate of carbon price growth rate then it's not optimal um, most of the time if we look at the condition where the row crop price is positive uh, then permanence is not optimal under the equal even under the equality of uh, grow, growth rates in soil carbon and the growth rate in carbon price so it might be a little bit confusing but now uh, we might <laughs> we can come back to that later so additional idea so when payments are made for the total carbon benefits uh, the cost efficiency of the payment scheme doesn't depend on the energy crop acreage without carbon benefits and addressing additionality requires that uh, we offer carbon payments to landowners for the additional carbon benefits only such that the cost efficiency of such payment scheme doesn't depend upon energy crop acreage without carbon benefits so which means the uh, for the to for the payment scheme where where the landowners are um, paid for carbon benefits from additional energy crop acreage is more cost efficient than uh, the payment scheme where the farmers are paid for carbon benefits from total energy crop acreage however the choice of the benchmark doesn't impact the optimal outcome in terms of sequestration and mitigation amounts so here are some simulation results uh, uh, so basically we have two baseline scenarios where we don't uh, we don't account for the benefits of soil carbon or we assume a zero carbon price two baselines uh, and then first baseline we have row crop price constant and the second baseline row crop price is increasing exponentially at 1% to compare against these two baseline scenarios we have four different uh, scenarios where carbon has carbon soil carbon payment is dollar per sorry 50 dollar per ton in each scenario but then in first first scenario or scenario a we uh, assume all the all the prices are constant in second scenario or scenario b the row crop price is increasing the third scenario social cost of carbon is increasing and the fourth scenario is scenario d both the social cost of carbon and the row crop price are increasing over time so irrespective uh, irrespective of the relative prices we can see that uh, energy crop in first rotation is larger for longer payment duration and also in su successive rotations the energy crop acreage is larger for uh, payment duration with longer length so even for the scenario A, where we have like minimum losses in energy crop acreage under subsequent rotations, uh, the flow of soil carbon decreases because of the declining soil carbon sequestration rate over time. And there are maximum losses in carbon flows uh, that correspond to scenario B because there is a row crop price increasing exponentially at 1% or the remaining constant. So if we investigate the graph, you can see here um, uh, the optimal soil carbon flow. If we investigate the graph for scenarios B and D, where row crop price is increasing, the negative losses are kind of. I, I think I can say the negative losses are kind of uh, decreasing because we assume that the sequestration and desequestration process uh, exactly mimic each other. So desequestration is also happening at the decreasing rate. And for uh, emission abatement on the second figure, uh, second figure. You can see that uh, for scenarios B, C, and D, the emission abatements are very different across rotations only for B, C, and D scenarios because they only depend on energy crop acreage and energy crop acreage depends upon just the expected yield of energy crop. For scenario A, there is not much change in energy crop acreage. That's why optimal emission abatement uh, doesn't change by that much across rotations. So we look at the payments here, the unit payments and the total 
sequestration and mitigation payment. Uh, as we already mentioned, the sequestration payment pattern is just the shadow value of the soil carbon stock. So for scenarios A and B, uh, you can see that the, uh, the sequestration payment decreases from $49 per turn to $2.5 per turn at the end of the 75th year. For scenario C and D, where, soil, where cost of carbon is increasing at 1% exponentially, you can see that the sequestration payment first increases to $58 per turn and then subsequently de decreases to $4 per turn at the end of the 75th year. The mitigation payment only depends upon the cost, sorry, <clears throat> uh, carbon price, and it remains constant at $50 per ton for scenarios A and B, but then it subsequently increases to $105 per ton in scenarios C and D because of the 1% exponential growth in uh, carbon price. So we define the benchmark as the sequestration and mitigation amounts from energy crop production, even in the absence of carbon payments. So basically the first and second figure in the top row shows the additional soil carbon flows as well as additional abatement compared to the corresponding baselines. And in the bottom, uh, bottom row, the first and second figure show the total sequestration payment and total mitigation payment while accounting for this issue of additionality. So these are some of the conclusions. So basically we design an efficient carbon payment for soil carbon sequestration, taking into account the temporary nature of soil carbon sequestration and also the changes in the uh, carbon prices over time. So we also saw that, that paying social cost of carbon for soil carbon sequestration does not guarantee permanence when there are changes in row crop prices as well as uh, declining soil carbon sequestration rate over time. We also saw that the efficient dollar per hectare payments for um, carbon payments are both temporarily and especially heterogeneous. And the last one is like, we can efficiently address the issue of impermanence and soil carbon sequestration payment by designing a time variant sequestration payment. And also the issue of additionality can be addressed by choosing the right benchmark. That's it for now. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, you have a question? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. But um, I guess my question is, do you have a scenario for a specific area that we said, you know, that's more sensible to look at a specific um, area or a specific actual type of like what they're actually being regarding the world from? Because like all of these scenarios like seems very abstract to me. I, I like I, it's very hard for me to visualize what like, exactly is uh -huh. going on. But if you have like a real life example or real life setup, it could potentially be like compared to understand what exactly is going. But I mean, um, I think the simulation method makes total sense. Like I use simulation, I own research. But like, do you happen to? Is this like a standard thing to do in the simulation literature that you look at like a specific area, or it's just you know having a base case and then like the yeah so i think uh, everything has to do with the here everything has to do with the social cost of carbon right because everything is revolving our social cost of carbon and whether it's changing over time or not and uh, another important aspect was even before going to scenarios and baseline the as important aspect of uh, soil carbon sequestration we are looking here is like uh, soil carbon sequestration under energy crop or miscanthus or switchgrass, it decreases over time. That's what we are trying to say here. So ton of carbon sequestered in the early years is higher compared to when it's sequestered in the later years. So basically, if there are some incentives in terms of sequestration and mitigation payment um, for energy crop production, uh, after 10 or 15 years, farmers might realize that 
the total carbon payments they are getting from below ground soil carbon sequestration is not enough to cover what they expected in the earlier year. So in the next rotation, they will say, okay, I will just convert back to row crops, conventional row crops like corn or soybean, right? But we don't want to, we don't want them to do that or we, we are not sure if that's optimal or not. That's what I'm trying to say. So even going to different baselines and assumptions of prices and relative prices, right? So that was first point. And uh, the temporary nature of soil carbon sequestration is because mitigation is you, you displace fossil fuels using biofuels, you are done. You abated how many quantities, right? But soil carbon sequestration is like, uh, you store it in the soil for 10 years, you uproot the plant, the stored soil carbon releases back into the atmosphere. So what happened with the payment you already made to the landowners, it's not socially optimal now, right? Because they release the supposed to be stored carbon, right? So those are real scenarios. <laughs> Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It, it, it just revolves around, uh, that's what I'm saying. It just revolves around uh, a lot of uh, things related to soil carbon sequestration, right? And a lot of things relates to how we price the carbon, right? So, so basically, yeah, without some kind of assumption on those prices and changes, we are not going to discuss anything. And because there is no biomass price, literally, and no one is cultivating miscanthus and switchgrass. So we have to be in the hypothetical world to make all these cases, right? So I, yeah. Yeah. This actually. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question and thank you for clarifying Fahad. <laughs> the, the riskiness is another important thing. It's a big deal with farmers, right? Because you don't want to just convert your scone and soybean into some random energy crop and next year you don't have any yield and you are done for the year. <laughs> so. <laughs> Fahad is working on a lot of stuff related to risk and uncertainty. So in future we have answers maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I feel like we will sound like we will talk about it. I think it's climate change is just a little longer. Very, 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 very. Okay, thank you. Okay, you have a question? Okay, sure. <laughs>
um, actually that learning effect over time gets them thinking and more comfortable um, thinking of spaces or, or engaging in those spaces. And so, you know, when designing policy, you know, maybe it would be less, not optimal for a given payment, but if it's encouraged producers to kind of re, um, re adopt, um, it might be over the long run. Yeah, I think uh, the problem is with the establishment is establishing these crops, right? These are very, very expensive crops to establish. First three years of establishment, like uh, literally, <laughs> they are so expensive. So either either way, either with uh, any kind of dollar per hectare payments for just converting land to energy crops or any kind of payments that will incentivize is in any form it's needed. Yeah. And a lot of things, uh, you know, there are a lot of um, uh, synergistic ecosystem services coming from these crops. The literature has shown it's not just soil carbon stock. Uh, a lot of things like um, water nutrient leaching and nitrate reduction, and then soil erosion control. So every everything, every ecosystem service or positive externally has to be valued at some dollar per ton or whatever it is. So then combining all these things, then it could be socially optimal. To pay these crops, right? But not individually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, I think uh, this concludes the session, right? <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining. <laughs>